Hey everybody, before we get started, I just want to let you know I'm probably going to make a few goofs in this run through and if you want to know what they are, be sure to set your subtitles onto the Klingon channel. That's right, the Klingon channel where all of my mistakes will be dutifully recorded. Kapla! And now, today your auto runs through Diceborn Heroes, which is a cooperative dice game that's on Kickstarter right now and I'm going to be doing a two play run through today so you can see what it's all about and decide whether you might want to back it. And here's what you get. You get a bunch of cards. Now that's not all of them. These are just some. There's also a whole bunch more big old stack of different quests and whatnot that you can go on. And you get a whole bunch of dice. Lots and lots and lots of dice. The players will be rolling every round to determine what it is their characters can do. And I've already gone on ahead and set up a two-player game. This is me, this is Jen. In a two-player game, each player controls two individual characters. And I chose them completely randomly. I just took the big old stack of all the different character cards, shuffled them up, and gave Jen two and me two. And that's how I ended up with a thief and a fighter, and Jen's got a mage and a fighter. So we will not be having any priests along to keep us alive, which could be kind of scary. We'll see how that goes. All right, so we've each got our starting characters, and each character gets their own starting bounty. What would happen is I would deal three to myself, one more than the number of characters I'm controlling, and then pick two of those, which I've already done. So, my thief is a noble and spy from the north, looking to infiltrate and stop the tech war research. He's got, he's got a secret leveling up goal of having no wounds at the end of a quest. This fighter wants to have defeated two undead monsters. The mage wants to have survived. All monsters that are alive have to be stunned for him to achieve his goal. He's an apprentice for the summoner Sholdova, skilled and certain of his ability. Or her ability. The, there are male and female versions of all the characters as well. So anyway, that's what the mage wants to do. And this other fighter wants to have defeated two stunning monsters. Monsters who have the stun ability. Because he is a student of alchemy. Oh, he was a student of alchemy, but this hero chose a different path away from the books. Okay, so they've got their starting uh, situations. Each player uh, starts with one green die, which is a basic die, plus one die for each of their characters. Green and green. So that means each of us are starting with three. But as these characters level up, they might start getting into the realm of red or blue dice, which I'll show later on. Because the overall structure of the game is you're going to sit down and you're going to go through three specific quests that are part of a storyline indicated by this icon. So today, we're going to start out at the ancient church where the chancellor claims there's a lost treasure held by a necromancer that will bring prosperity to the land. So he sent us out, but it could be a trap. After we beat this and defeat this necromancer, we will move on to the palace square where Princess Sona, well, you might think she just needs to be rescued, but she is tough. She might actually rescue us. And then finally, we would end up at Devalent's Castle. We play through all three of these, and in each one of these areas, we're going to have to defeat a number of monsters by rolling dice and using all of our special abilities while trying to achieve our goals as we go. So, um, in this first one, uh, step one, we only need the monsters from deck one, not deck two, deck three, or any boss cards. Let's see, also, this is a deck of all kinds of cool upgraded relics and whatnot that we can get as kind of a overall, what would you call it, uh, a campaign. Because the interesting thing is, Jen and I, we've actually already played through this game twice. We've gone through two full sets of quests. What were they? Oh, I don't have them out anymore. But the interesting thing is, after you go through a quest, the, st the, the cool relics you find throughout uh, get added. Even though those characters retire, the stuff you found gets added to the item deck so you have a chance to get it later. And the bosses and whatnot you fought along the way add new attack cards to the enemy attack deck. So, as you play through quest after quest after quest, these decks change and grow over time. But in the meantime, we've come to the ancient church. It could be a trap. And what are we going to have to do here? We are going to have to confront the necromancer. That means set up. Add the necromancer. So the necromancer is a fighter. Normally, you fight a number of monsters equal to the number of characters. But in this case, we're going to have one extra, the necromancer. And let's see here. 
And if all enemies are defeated, we get an item from the deck. All right, so we are going to get, uh, because we're having to fight an extra bad guy above and beyond, we will get a free item for winning this. But there are other things here as well. While we're fighting the Necromancer, if we sacrifice one of our dice to search the church, we will find a relic, the Holy Idol. So this is an optional thing we can do that limits our ability to fight, but could give us an extra boost. And right here is a little summary of the Necromancer's stats. He's got four hit points. As long as he's alive, all un dead enemies do plus one damage and when we defeat him we get to shuffle back in or we get to add two discarded cards which I'll mention in a little bit oh and oh he also he is undead so he himself all undead enemy attacks he does one I guess he must do two because he himself is undead so that's kind of scary alrighty anyway so there would normally be four monsters for us to fight but in this case there's gonna be five and let's just go on ahead and see what they are. We've got a scorpion. No undead. No undead. And an aquamite. That, oh, that's a stunner. And we, I do want to take out stunners. And an asp. Oh, my gosh. If we get lucky and no undeads. Wow, and a wolf. There is a... Wait, there's like a skeleton. So we didn't get the skeleton. And we didn't get the ghost. That's good. Because that means his special power is a little bit less useful. He'll still use it on himself. But all these other guys aren't buffed up by him. So this is what we're lined up. We've got to beat these guys. And if we do, we complete the first quest. And then we get to go back to town and we get to level up and move on to the next quest. And leveling up in this game is very, very cool. But anyway, we're set. How does the game work? Here is a nice little turn order summary. And on the other side is a nice little summary of all the different effects. You know, stunning and blocking and all that kind of stuff. But anyway... Um, so, we have revealed one monster per hero, unless noted, because in this case we had to do the other one. And now, uh, the way combat works is we roll and assign dice to our actions, then we reveal the attack cards for the monsters, and then resolve from lowest to highest. So let's do it. Ah, uh, this is my three dice. I got a uh, six, a six, and a three. High numbers are good in this game, usually. A three, five, and a five. Okay. So... Jen and, now, Jen and I now go on ahead and assign our dice. I can assign one die to my fighter and one die to my thief. Jen can do the same. Now, if we want to, remember there's this thing about searching the church. If I want to, instead of assigning a die to my fighter, I can say, hey, you know what? My fighter this turn is going to do this. And I could assign the die that I would give to him over here to complete that bonus goal. But that means that's a round that he's sitting out. And even though he'll get to fight in the next round, I will have lost that die for the rest of this fight. And that means in future rounds, I've only got two dice. I got to give one to, you know, it's nice to have three because, hey, I rolled low, but I got two high. So both my guys can do a high value. So that's an interesting choice. Um, plus, of course, every character has different abilities. No matter what die I roll, this fighter, can, I can always put a green die here and bash. That means I just do a point of damage and smash through an enemy's shields if they've got it. But if I've got a four or better, I will counter, which means if anybody attacks my fighter, because I put a four on here, I will automatically counterattack them, and I'll get a shield, which might last into a future round. If I have a six, I can place this on here, and that means I do a body slam. I do three damage right out, but then I suffer one myself. And you know what? This guy, this wolf has a four, but this is a three, this is a two, this is a three, and he's a four. So I could just start out with a body slam and almost take somebody offline completely. Although I'll take some damage myself. What the heck? Let's say I'm going to do that. I'm going to have this fighter do a body slam, and I'll figure out later who he's going to hit. So now I've still got a three and a six for my thief. Now, what can I do with that? Well, my thief's basic attack is hidden blade. Do an attack, and uh, you can't be counterattacked. Let's see here. Interestingly, none of the bad guys that came out have the counterattack ability. But, let's see, if, or if this ghost had come out, not only would this ghost be pumped up by the necromancer, but every time you strike the ghost, you automatically get counterattacked and you take one point of damage. Same thing for this rack root, this uh, living plant monster. Feed me, Seymour. You attack him, you get hit back. But the thief's special normal ability is they hit and they can't be counterstruck. Now that doesn't matter so much in this fight because nobody does counterstrikes. Moving on up to a four plus, you get to evade. The first person who tries to attack this thief just automatically misses and do a point of damage. And a six, plunder. Do a point of damage and then draw an item from the item deck and give it to somebody. So we can just start getting items and um, becoming more powerful during the fight. So what the heck? I think I'm going to plunder over here. So that means I'm not assigning my three, and neither of these characters are going to try to search the church to find the Holy Idol. But you know what? We're going to go for a few rounds of combat. We'll have a chance to do that later. Now, 
Like I said, the higher the number, the more powerful the move, but there's a downside. The more powerful the move, the slower you go. Um, on the flip side, if you use a, a one or two or a three, now if, if Jen, she has this three and she uses it for just a bash or frost on her mage, that means she gets to go much quicker. And before, after we assign our dice, but before we do any attacking, we will find out what the speed of these five bad guys are. Now, my two guys are going super slow. So it doesn't matter how slow the bad guys are going, I have a chance of each of these guys getting hit several times. But if you go really fast and a bad guy goes slow, that means the bad guy can't touch you. So the lower the value, the weaker your attack, but the less likely you are to be hit by the bad guys. So now what does Jenga do? A five, five, and a three. And of course, if you just go off and search the church, that means you didn't assign any dice to yourself, so no bad guy will hit you because you're off in there while everybody else is fighting outside. So let's see. So Jen's got a fighter is the same. This mage, the basic one is do damage to two enemies. One damage to two enemies. So that's pretty cool. The four plus is lightning. Do one damage to three enemies, and they have to be th separate enemies. And then the fireball, um, first of all, if anybody hits this mage, they will automatically take a point of damage because, you know, the mage is powering up a big fireball, so they'll get on fire, they'll get singed, and the fireball does two points of damage. So that's pretty cool. Let's see here. Let's go on ahead and have the mage do a five. So, and we'll hope most bad guys hit the mage, Although the, ma the mage only has three hit points. But every time a bad guy hits a mage, they're going to get counter-struck because the mage is on fire. And let's have this fighter. So this fighter with a five could go up to do a counter, which is also an auto-strike, and will shield himself. Or he could go a bit quicker and do a bash, which will smash through an enemy shield, just in case the enemies have any shields. Now the wolf um, has four hit points, and when he attacks, it hits two people for one. The asp hits one for two. The aquamite, when defeated, every hero gets stunned. That's pretty scary. I think we might, even though the Aquamite's really quick and easy to kill, it only has two hit points, we might want to save it for the end, so, because we don't want to be stunned um, you know, for the rest of the fight, because you have to heal that off. The scorpion, Every time it hits, it does a strike and it does a stun. Yikes. And then, remember, the Necromancer would power up other undead, but also powers himself up. So he's basically just doing two points of damage, the same as the ass, but he's got four hit points. So that's the situation. They're about to counter strike. Do I go fast? Let's see. Well, none of them have any implicit shielding ability. So smashing through shields isn't that great. So I could just come up here and shield myself. But that means all of my characters are going pretty slow. But you know what? That's good. Because if only one character was going slow, that character would probably get dogpiled by all the bad guys and might get killed. Now that all my characters are going roughly the same speed, but all fairly slow, chances are the damage will get spread out amongst them. We'll see how this works out. So anyway, so neither of us play Star 3. Nobody is searching the church. And now we see what the bad guys do. They've got this ta uh, uh, deck of attack cards. You shuffle it up at the beginning, and each enemy gets one. The Necromancer is moving at a speed of five. This has nothing to do with how much damage you do. This is their activation. This is like their initiative. The Scorpion is very slow at a speed of six. The Aquamite is a speed of three. Is pretty quick. Oh. Remember how I was saying, because we have finished other adventures and campaigns and this deck has changed, when we had beaten the Leviathan, this Leviathan attack card got added. You can tell it's a special card because it's got stars. So, whoever gets this, the Asp is going to get this, is going to have a shield. And... Um, so we do that. The Asp is going to be shielded, and it says draw another card, so the Asp is moving at speed 5 and is shielded. So that Asp is pretty dangerous. And now I'm wishing we had bashed! Ah, because then we could bash through that shield. Alrighty, and then the last but not least, the Wolf is a 6. Alright, so we're going slow. The bad guys are, for the most part, going fairly slow as well. Although that Akamite is fairly quick. Alright. So, now, um, the bad guys are ready to go, we're ready to go, and we start resolving things. If there was anybody who had a 1, uh, you know, an attack with a level of 1, that means they would be the fastest in the land, but they don't. There's no 1s. There's no 2s. There is a 3. So this Aquamite is going to strike first. He's going to do 1 point of damage. Now, the enemy chooses whoever is closest to it in speed. If any of us, if, if this fighter had used the 3 instead of the 5, then, oh, the, the speed 3 enemy would go for the speed 3 vil, uh, speed three 
um, hero. But she didn't. So there's, there's no threes. There's no fours. There's two fives. So this guy's going to hit one of the fives. If there were no fives, he'd hit a six. So, and there's two fives. So we get to choose as players who takes the point of damage from this Aquamite, the mage or the fighter. Well, the fighter has four hit points. The mage only has three. So I think this fighter will take the first point of damage. And that's a bummer because the fighter... Um, although it's not too bad, um, because if either of these two characters get hit, first of all, as soon as you put a die on, even if you haven't gotten to their speed for them to act, their counter strikes automatically, the things in these red. So this Aquamite immediately took a point of damage. And that's kind of scary. One more hit and this Aquamite dies and everybody gets stunned. Ah, I don't want that to happen. That's pretty scary. Um, but anyway, so I uh, hit and took a counterpoint of damage. So that's it for the threes. Are there any manus with a four? No, uh, neither of us. Now we move on to the fives. The Asp is moving at a five, as is Jen's Mage and Fighter. And so now we can make these go... <clears throat> In any order we want. If we want the Asp to go first, the Asp is going to choose to hit one of these two characters and do two points of, uh, yeah, two points of damage. Ouch. Um, but, remember, they will get counterstruck, but unfortunately they've got that shield. So, um, it won't hurt. The counterstrike won't hurt. Who takes the two points of damage? I guess it'll be the fighter. All right, so the fighter, but, no, 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 actually, no, let's have the fighter go first. So the fighter is going to go, now he's already done, I mean, this is a passive action. If anybody attacks him, he'll counter-strike, but he also gets a shield. All right, so first the fighter's gone, he's done activating. Now, you know what, let's, what the heck, let's go on ahead and have the mage go first. We'll have the asp go last, it's our choice. The mage has this passive counter-attack and is going to do a fireball and hit somebody for two. Now, who are we going to hit for two? Um, well, it'd be way, one of them would be lost because of this shield. It'd be good to finish somebody, and, and my, two, my two slowest guys haven't gone yet. This plunderer, or no, I'm sorry, this body slam is going to do three. It would be nice to take out this wolf who hits two guys for one really quick. Let's say the necromancer is going to do two points of damage to the wolf, two of the four hit points. Or, I'm sorry, not the necromancer, the mage. So, the, the, right, so the... Fighter is gone and gave himself a shield. The mage is gone and done two points of damage to the wolf. You can see this is a number two. On the other side is a number one. Okay, so they're done. Now the asp strikes back. And because there's two choices, we get to choose where he strikes. Either way, he's going to get counterstruck. But it doesn't matter because of the shield. All right, so all we care about is who takes more damage. I guess we'll have the fighter take two more damage. He has taken... Well, no. Um, but he'll, he should take two, but since he had the shield, he only takes one. So the fighter has now hurt for two. He's got four total hit points. So that's it. All the number fives are resolved, and now the number sixes. Ever oh, wait. Oh, hold on, folks. Kind of forgot something. The necromancer was also speed five. I, I forgot we had this extra bonus fight going on. So who's he going to hit? He's going to hit for two. Normally he does one, but all undeads, including himself, get plus one. So he can, if he hits the fighter for two, the fighter's dead or KO'd, which means we have to wake him back up and that's kind of scary. So we'll have the mage take it. So the mage takes two points of damage. This is really scary. Um, but the mage counter strikes and hits the necromancer right back. So the necromancer has taken one point of damage. Hmm. Okay. You know what? Thinking about it, actually, if we had had the Necromancer take that point of damage as well, then we could just focus fire on the Necromancer who does two points of damage, but it all goes to one character. Yeah, so let's say the fireball went to the Necromancer guy. I just totally forgot he was there. And the Necromancer just hit the mage but got counterstruck. So the Necromancer only has one more hit point. All righty. And that's it for the fives. Now we move on to the sixes. Both of mine are super slow. The wolf and the scorpion are super slow. They can, we can all make them go at any time. Oh, by the way, I should have said, as the enemies were activating their cards, when the Alchemite went, the speed goes into the attack discard pile. So these have all gone into the attack discard pile. This is how you keep track of who is attacked and who hasn't. So um, I've still got, and let's see. Now I want to go first. With this body slam, my fighter can do three points of damage and then suffer one damage himself. So I think he's going to do that, which means he takes one point of damage, but he does three, and he's just going to take this scorpion out completely. So the scorpion had three hit points, which means the scorpion is never going to get a chance to hit or stun anybody. Scorpion is toast. And now that means um, this fighter takes it as kind of a trophy. 
It really, it's money that we'll be able to use to buy stuff in the next round. All right, so we've gotten our first kill, our first bit of stuff we can spend back home. I'll just put this off out of the way. Um, well, I was going to put it right here. All right, so got a kill and prevented that thing. So this guy is never going to get a chance to strike, but he took one point of damage himself. Now, the thief is going to do one point of damage to somebody and then plunder, draw an item. So let's have the thief go. We'll have the wolf go last. So the thief does one point damage. I think he'll do it to the necromancer, and boom, the necromancer is toast. But I already forgot something. Before we move on to the thief doing his attack, we took out, what was it? We took out the scorpion, who had three hit points. The scorpion will never get to stun or do damage to us. This card here says, upon killing the scorpion, we get to take two discarded cards and add them back to the attack deck. And that is hugely important. So we take the two cards off the top, and we put them at the bottom of the deck. This deck is a timer. It represents our exhaustion. If this deck ever empties out, you'll see this gets revealed. Each hero, every time we need to draw a card for an enemy to determine how fast they're gonna go, uh, if there are no cards, that enemy won't attack, but instead, each hero, all the heroes, will suffer one wound. So, because we're all exhausted. So that's the thing. We have to kill these monsters fast to keep the discarded cards going back into the attack deck so that we don't get exhausted. Alrighty. So anyway, so we took that guy out and um, you know, we got rejuvenated a little bit from that kill. Then, the thief went on ahead. Oops. The thief did one point damage to the necromancer. The necromancer is taken out and that says, hey, we get to put two more cards back in the attack deck so we're not going to get exhausted anytime soon. And the Necromancer is gone. And the Necromancer is, for all intents and purposes, it, this is a trophy as well. It'll be another dollar we have to spend. Um, but we still leave this out for now. I guess we can just go ahead and leave this as a reminder that he's tote. He's dead. Because while this fight is still going on, we still have the chance to search the church and gain a holy relic, which won't only um, help us in this series of three quests. After we've gotten the holy relic, it will live in our item deck for all future games that we play when we go into other um, quests. So anyway, so that's it. And now the wolf is uh, the uh, last enemy to go because everybody else... Oh, wait. Oh, no. So um, the, the thief did the plunder, did a point damage, and now draws an item. Ooh, the Astral Miller. This is a relic that we had won in a previous quest. So, this gets added to anybody, and this becomes a new action they can use their dice for. Uh, add a, put a, any color, five or six, to prevent the first enemy... Um, oh, what is that symbol? Well, we have a nice little summary of what all the symbols are. The first enemy counterattack. Although, interestingly, there were no enemy counterattacks. So right now, the Astral Mirror is not going to help us. But if we go up against enemies who have a lot of counterattacks, this could be a real saver. It's another use for our die. So now one of the characters gets this. And let's go on ahead and have the fighter get it. So the fighter now carries the Astral Mirror. And this is, because this is now Jen's Astral Mirror, this is another use she has for her dice in the future, in addition to putting one die on each character. Um, because, you know, you could actually place all three dice. Because if you have a five or plus, you could do, um, in addition to only putting one per character, you could do this, the Astral Mirror. Okay, so that was it. Now the wolf steps up to the plate. He, these two characters, they were at a five. They were too fast. The wolf can't hit them. If all of our characters had five, the wolf hit, hit, wouldn't hit anybody because he's so slow. Everybody was so much faster. Even at a five, he wouldn't hit. But as it is, these two characters are slow enough, so the wolf is going to hit one of them. I will ha And unfortunately, we did six and six. So we don't have the stealth or the counter strike active. So one of these two characters is just going to take two points of damage, and that's it. Let's go on ahead and, and make it this fighter because this fighter has three hit points. And this, um, although the thief, but the fighter's already taken one point of damage. Ah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. Okay, so that's it. And the wolf is done. All right. And that was it, folks. That was the first round. And um, now we're going to move on to the next round. We're going to take all our dice back. We're going to roll them up. We're we only have three bad guys left to fight. And we're going to assign them. We now have two additional places we could assign our dice. We're, and you know, if this thief keeps plundering, we could keep finding more and more items for free instead of having to buy them when we get back to town. Um, before it's over, before we kill all these guys, we, and we don't want to kill this Aquamite. Because, I mean, that would really... Because what happens is when you're stunned, it doesn't matter how fast you go, whatever die you place, you end up going last in turn order, no matter how fast you might be. So, um, yeah. But that was just the first of several rounds. We, you know, a given quest is going to probably run... 
two to four rounds, depending on how big and complex and how long it is. We've got, we've got this Aquamite who almost dead. We can take these guys out with a couple of well-placed slams, but it depends on what we roll. So going into the next round, what does Jen roll? She's got, ooh, high numbers, but slow. And me, I've got, oh, ooh, I could go super fast with that one. I'm going to I think I'm going to have this fighter. He's going to go super fast, which means he'll bash, he'll remove his shield. That's not going to help much because nobody is shielded. But he's going to be so fast that chances are nobody will hit him as long as the attacks, you know, say two or more. But if an attack of one gets drawn, this fighter will get hit, and he's on his last legs. And unfortunately, folks, we do not have any priests who, as you might imagine, can heal us up. So we got to do, fa we got to go fast and hard. But anyway, that's the role going into the second round. If you'd like to watch that, uh, see me finish this quest and then go to town and do some leveling up, you can hit the I to go to the extended playthrough, or instead you can go to Final Thoughts. Your choice in five, four, three, two, one.